Okay, we've all been there with the excuses. I just don't have time for that. I'll do it tomorrow. Is skipping one day really gonna make a difference? Or my absolute favorite, I just can't be bothered. Procrastination gets all of us at some time or another. And if you are anything like me, you'll find that you procrastinate more than you actually get any work done. But I have just reread Brian Tracy's Eat That Frog. And I'm gonna share with you some of my favorite tips from the book to beat procrastination, as well as telling you which ones I don't agree with and why. Okay, first off, I would say that this book is divided into three key areas, or what I like to call the three Ds. Define, decide, and do. So let's take a look at these one by one. First up is defining. In other words, getting clear about what it is that we're working towards. We need to set our goals. What is it that we're trying to achieve? Because without this, what are we even working towards? Now, Stephen Covey said that if the ladder is not leaning up against the right wall, then every step we take just gets us to the wrong place faster. Now, this isn't a task that you do very often, maybe every three, six, or even 12 months. So take your time, don't rush it and put some thought into it. Remember, clarity is key, but at the same time, it doesn't have to be perfect. You can always keep revisiting and course correct along the way. The important thing is to write it down. Now, the book actually says that only 3% of adults have clear written goals, and these people accomplish five to 10 times as much as those who don't. There are actually seven steps set out in the book to help you get clear. One, decide exactly what you want. Two, write it down. Three, set a deadline and sub deadlines if necessary. Four, make a list of everything you can think of that you need to do to achieve that goal. Five, organize that list into a plan by priority and sequence. Six, take action on your plan immediately. This can be something small, but it's just to gain momentum. Seven, resolve to do something every single day that moves you towards your major goal. Okay, brilliant. Now we have something to work towards. The next step is to do some deciding or planning. Now, one of my favorite quotes is by Abraham Lincoln, and it goes, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four sharpening the ax. This shows just how important planning can be. This is one of those tasks that actually probably doesn't take that much time to do when integrated properly, but it is also where a lot of people fall down, myself included. It's one of those, it's easy to do, but it's just as easy not to do type scenarios. Now, every minute spent planning can save up to 10 minutes in execution, which means if you just take 10 minutes at the start of your day to plan your day, you could save up to two hours of wasted time and effort by the end of the day. Now, that sounds like something that's worth doing to me. Now, one thing to consider when planning is the 80-20 principle. In other words, the vital few versus the trivial many. So say, for example, you had 10 tasks to do for a day. It could be that one or two of those tasks are worth more than the other eight or nine tasks combined, in which case those one to two are the tasks that you need to focus on. So before you begin work, always ask yourself, is this task in the top 20% of my activities or in the bottom 80%? The rule is that you should resist the temptation to clear the small task first, but I will come back to my thoughts on this rule later in the video. Now it could be that you're not clear on what falls into the 20% and what falls into the 80%, in which case a good exercise could be to ask yourself the following three questions. One, what are my highest value activities? In other words, what will make the biggest contribution towards my goal? Two, what can I and only I do that if done well will make a difference? And three, what is the most valuable use of my time right now? Another way of doing this is by using the A, B, C, D, E method. Now, the way this works is that you write out all the tasks that you have to do on the day. And against each one, we're gonna assign one of the five letters and the letters correspond to the following key. A are your must do tasks, B are your should do tasks, C are your could do tasks, D are your tasks that you should delegate, and E are tasks that you should eliminate. Now, if you have more than one task that falls into the A category, then you can categorize this and prioritize this further by assigning it a letter. So you'll end up with an A1, an A2, and an A3, for example. By the way, guys, how many of you are procrastinating right now by watching this video? Let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. Finally, a couple more tips to round off the planning section. First, environment is key, so make sure you're comfortable. 
Secondly, you need to be prepared. So set up your workspace to minimize distractions and have everything you need to hand. Basically, it's like getting all your ingredients out, prepped and measured before you start cooking. Okay, we have our goal set and a plan to follow, which means it's time for us to actually do some work now. Now this is the part I usually hate because it's by this point that I think I've done such a stellar job in planning and prepping that I decide it's time for me to take a break. I'll be back in five minutes, right? No sweat. Famous last words. One hour later. Okay, I'm back, but I'm still not really in the mood to do any work. Brian says that we should motivate ourselves into action through positivity and optimism. I had totally agreed with every point up until now, but I'm not on board with this one. Whilst that's great in theory or on good days, it's not what's going to get you through the bad days. The days where you're wondering what the point of it all is, or you're feeling crap. On the days where no amount of positive mental attitude is going to help, because you just can't be positive. This is where discipline comes in. You need to be disciplined and take action. That action will lead to success and that success will in turn lead to motivation. To give you an example, I've wanted to make YouTube videos for many years now. And although I'd get psyched up every so often about the idea, there was never enough motivation for me to actually put anything into practice. All the other emotions like fear of failure, perfectionism, people thinking I look stupid and so on got in the way. When I would try and work out why it was that I never followed through and actually put any of this into practice, I would always come to the conclusion that it was because I didn't want it enough. That's why I wasn't motivated. But that isn't true and the dream hasn't gone away. Then, towards the end of last year, I decided to take YouTube seriously and treat my channel as a business. Thank you, Ali. And be disciplined about putting out content. So I set myself a goal of putting out one video every week. Now to begin with, this was slow and took a huge amount of energy. But as time went on, I started feeling good about what I'd created and what I'd put out. And people actually started liking my videos. So that led to me being motivated to put out more content. The motivation came from taking action, which came from the discipline. Now, if I was just waiting around for motivation to strike before I took action, I'd probably still be waiting. I've been putting it off as much as possible, but there's nothing left to do other than eat that frog now. The whole premise of the book is based around the idea that we should eat that frog. In other words, we should do our most important task first. After all, Mark Twain said, if it's your job to eat a frog, it's best to do it first thing in the morning. And if it's your job to eat two frogs, it's best to eat the biggest one first. The idea being that you can then go through the rest of the day knowing that the worst is behind you. But my frog is obviously something I really don't want to do and something that I've made into a much bigger, scarier thing than it actually is. So by just telling myself to suck it up and eat that frog isn't gonna work. No, I need to trick my brain into thinking it doesn't actually have to eat that frog. So instead, I need to boil that frog. The parable goes, if a frog is put suddenly into boiling water, it will jump out. But if the frog is instead put in tepid water, which is then brought to a boil slowly, it will not perceive the danger and will be cooked to death. In other words, I need to warm myself up a bit first. So I try and warm my brain up in the same way that I would warm my body up before a workout. Remember earlier when I said Brian's rule was to resist the temptation to clear up small tasks first? Well, it turns out I actually like to start with these simple tasks. So whether that's answering a few simple emails, casting my eye back over work I did the day before, or even finishing off some of the work I started the day before, I also like to get some small tasks out of the way first, so that way they're not weighing on my mind through the day. So if there's a few very simple, straightforward tasks, I will just get them done first thing in the morning and out of the way. And I get that dopamine hit by ticking them off the list nice and early. With this in mind, I already feel productive. I've ticked things off my list. I've got work done. I don't have a lot of things weighing on my mind and hopefully it's not actually taken too long either. So my discipline to just do a few simple tasks has allowed me to warm up my brain and get into the scope of things. And that way I can get started on the big task without even realizing that I'm about to get started on a big task. So now I'm feeling ready to start, but even then I don't dive straight in. This is obviously a big task. So I take a minute or two to plan the task itself. Because it's so big, there are usually several steps involved. So I make that tick sheet and as I go, I can tick them off and get my dopamine hit. But also when you get inevitably interrupted, you know exactly where you are in that process. Now, if it's a really big or important task, then it can often still feel daunting to start. This is where we need to make it as frictionless as possible. And where I like to ask myself the Tim Ferriss question, 
What would this look like if it were easy? Remember, it doesn't have to be 100% perfect. It just needs to be done. We can apply the 80-20 rule here as well. 80% of the work will come from 20% of the effort. Here are a couple of tips to help you push through and finish the task. The first is remember Parkinson's law. Work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion, which means the longer you give a task, the longer that task will take. So block out a certain amount of time for it and try and get it done in that time. Create a sense of urgency and your own deadline for it. The second is to switch off distractions and do not attempt to multitask. You need to focus on one task single-handedly until it's complete. You need to focus and that's the only way you can get into flow state. Ultimately, any action is better than no action. And Wayne Gretzky once said that you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. So go and do one thing towards your goal right now, no matter how small create that momentum. If you like this, then be sure to check out my previous book summary, which should be linked somewhere on the screen right now. Otherwise, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.